them, um, or they don't do as well with the kind of management that we're doing there. Like the, we don't, at least in our main garden, we don't have we don't do tillage, but we have to have like the broad fork. Um, we're adding a bunch of manure or, and compost. Um, and it's just, it's kind of a different thing than what they were being, how they were being cultivated here by indigenous but we do have a bunch of native food crops on our property, which we've been harvesting and um, trying to figure out how to best propagate them and keep them around. Um, this spring, we harvested a bunch of cannas and ate it. Um, and cannas is as an edible bowl. It's a lily. You probably saw it They're blooming in the spring and a lot down in some of the valley farm where it's left. Um, one of the interesting things about cannas and some of these other native food crops is that they're not annual. They are perennial crops. And cannas, this is a short example, has a bulb um, with fruit, but hanging off of it are little tiny bulbils. And so when you dig this part out, these are left, the bulbils are left to regrow and get bigger. So um, there's kind of a built-in regenerative aspect of using that as a food crop, which I think is really <laughs> fascinating. And that's why I think that that would be <laughs> right how to cultivate mm -hmm. these plants um, successfully. Yeah. I think you know, I read an article in the paper a while back, and maybe you know a lot more about this, but a lot of the, the wild plants are what we would call weeds mm -hmm. that haven't been uh, you know, cultivated or tamed right. actually have a lot more nutrition and healthful properties. Yeah. You know, like sorrel and so on and dandelion. You know. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering like what, what is that? Like we've degraded the seeds over the years for production or what might cause that? Well, I think our tastes um, have really, well, our tastes really dictate kind of what we're looking for in a plant. So and our tastes have changed. <laughs> yeah. Um, like as a culture, you know, I love the mine. And I, I mostly leave it, but I do dig it up where I want to have other things grow successfully. But then, you know, I harvest the root and toast it and use it to make tea because it's kind of like a coffee, so it's really tasty. Um, so there's things to do with it, but I leave a lot of it and just eat it. And I actually like it better than lettuce, you know? Um, I think it's funny to be out there like, trying to hoe oh, and I almost been near where they get this like the old lettuce to grow. And, you know, you just like step up all the way the lettuce and it out there. It's like, oh, well. Um, maybe we should th rethink that a little bit. <laughs> are the dandelion leaves, I heard when they're young, they're the best? Or yeah. is that, like, can you just, like, eat them in a full, like, just like, if you had a full salad of dandelion leaves, mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, I don't know, whatever mm -hmm. kind of lettuce leaf? Or would, is it, like, um, I mean, is it bitter, or is it, um, like, is it too high in certain nutrients that it might be, you can get off balance or something like that? No, not dandelion. Dandelion, I would say, go for it. Mm -hmm. Some things like sorrel, um, in particular, have a really high oxalic acid content. And um, there's a lot of, well, there's several um, plants that have that. Spinach, chard, mm -hmm. um, sorrel. Um, lamb's quarters, which is another weed that um, is definitely edible, but you can kind of see it when you turn the underside of the leaf over and there's like these little white crystal these like powdery stuff. Um, that leaches calcium from your bloodstream. <laughs> and it can be, it can have, it can be, um, people with Kidney issues can have issues eating food high in oxalic acid because it can contribute to kidney stones. So you have to be kind of careful 
Or you know, just know which plant, you know, they're gonna be eating a bunch of. Mm -hmm. um, but dandelions, I would say go for it. <laughs> yeah, um, just going back to the chemistry, I think I forgot my chemistry a little bit, but you were saying that the rain around here is slightly more acidic, uh -huh. and that has a negative charge. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit negatively charged. Um, so it gloms on to positively charged nutrients like calcium that removes them or washes them away essentially. Um, so organic adding organic matter can help with that. Adding lime can help with that. That's you know kind of an easier fix for a lot of farmers. And even you'll see a lot of even like big farmers who are still out there with their big plows applying lime. Um, just to bring the pH up enough to be able to grow the crops that they're trying to grow. Uh, yeah. So I said um, adding lime or vinegar, uh, depending on like the soil, is like a short term solution. Um, what are some like, maybe I missed this earlier, but what are some more long term, like, I don't know if there's like any passive solutions? And also, like embedded with that question is, um, <clears throat> do plants themselves like give up um, a certain pH? Like, can they help change the soil? Because I know like mushrooms are uh, totally like carbon based, and um, if that has like a effect to the pH levels. Yes. <laughs> Mark gave me the download, oh. but I'm here for the repetition. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, me too. <laughs> um, so, basically, uh, I'm just deciding if I need to go back here, but legumes um, Okay, I'm going to go with there's a whole host of plants on the planet that 
that have the ability because of the a partnership that they have with um, bacteria, the symbiotic relationship with bacteria that live on their roof. Um, they have the ability to fix nitrogen, to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and make it available to plants in the soil. Um, legumes are one of the main classes of plants that have this ability. Um, I'll just write down the, the type of bacteria. It's a, there's several different types and species of um, nitrogen fixing bacteria. But um, our atmosphere is about 70% nitrogen. Um, but it's in a form that plants can't use. They don't, um, even though, I know we're kind of jumping from carbon to nitrogen, so it's all, it's all related. Mm -hmm. um, basically, carbon is kind of like the, the fuel and makes up the, the body structure of a plant, but nitrogen is like the, it's like the, it's the primary growth element. It's what uh, promotes vegetative growth in a plant. So organic nitrogen fixation is a really critical part of the global nitrogen cycle and which is all about promoting plant growth. Um, and interestingly, nitrogen fertilizer is one of the main um, things that conventional farmers use to get plants to grow because they're not focusing on building soil organic matter. That rush of fertility that we talked about, a lot of the, the growth there, um, when the bacteria populations ramp up, they're eating carbon, but they're also taking nitrogen out of the soil. They eat, they take up both. So you can get away with adding nitrogen back and getting plants to grow just through the application of fertilizer. And you can kind of skip the whole adding organic matter part um, because the plants will still grow. And remember what I said at the beginning, conventional agriculture focuses on growing plants. That's the way that they basically achieve it through adding fertilizer. You can get a plant to grow by adding synthetic nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But the, the soil that it's grown in is going to be bereft of organic matter, which is going to also, um, over time especially, lead to mineral deficiencies that you're not necessarily going to notice in that, that year or that, well, within the crop itself, you, you know, they may look fine, but they don't have the, the same type of nutrient profile as one that's been grown in a really highly organic matter rich soil. What this leads to in a um, conventional setting um, is plants that are sick, plants that get stressed really easily. Um, and there's been research done on um, conventional versus organic farming approaches, and they found that plants that are stressed are ones that insects target, herbivorous insects, like insects that eat plants are the ones that we call pests. Mm -hmm. And in the conventional model, spray pesticides on. So basically what you've created in a conventional farming system is um, you know, a field, you plowed it up, you put your plants in, you've added your fertilizer, you get them to grow, but they start to um, you know, be attacked by pests. But the reason that they're being targeted is because they're stressed. Because you know, the soil, the, mineral, the minerals are imbalanced, the organic matter is low. There's all of these reasons why they are more susceptible and more um, more attractive to the animals, if you think about it in a kind of evolutionary sense, that are trying to basically just uh, 
weed them out, if you think about it, from like the survival of the fittest um, uh, viewpoint. They're not, they're not uh, very robust. So the idea that you then spray that with pesticides because the pests are a problem is just you know, perpetuated. It's the, the whole system is, you know, kind of leading to its own feedback. Like, we need pesticides because, well, but oftentimes people aren't even really thinking that the plants are stressed, but, you know, what you see is that, you know, if you have a thousand acre field of corn or potatoes, and all of a sudden there's an infestation and every plant has the corn earworm or every plant has the Colorado potato beetle, and it's like, what's going on? I need to spray this pesticide. But it's like, well, wait a second. <laughs> Step back from that and look at what's actually happening on the ground. Like, what, what have your farming practices been for the last 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell. <laughs> it's, um, what is the... Uh, so would you ever... Might think of planting weaker types of plants that are susceptible to bugs just to increase your organic matter in your that are susceptible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would, and what I've done is focus on building the soil through adding, through doing cover cropping, composting, crop rotation, stuff like that. Um, but what I found is, even in the garden here, or at my things, is that, like the plants that are on the edge of the, the sprinkler, um, like even if it's a whole row of cauliflower or something like that, the ones that are that don't get as much water, that maybe didn't get as much compost because they were just on the edge and it didn't get forked in as well, those are the ones that the aphids go. I see it over and over and over again. Um, even though I don't see that many pests anymore, but um, it's definitely evident that there's, you know, that that's true, that what we consider pests are attracted to plants that are susceptible to them. And it's kind of like us, too, like, you know, when we're run down, we're tired, we're, we haven't been, you know, we've been eating a bunch of sugar or whatever. It's not that there's bacteria that are like, you know, just bad and waiting for us. It's that we're susceptible to them. And we're, you know, in like integrated pest management classes, there's always the, there's the triangle between the susceptible host, the virulent pathogen, and the conditions that may get uh, be able to thrive. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's always those things going on. Um, can't really see that. Yeah. <laughs> Can that be a good thing somehow? Like you said, that you've noticed in your garden that um, the weaker plants are the ones that the pest attack. Mm -hmm. um, can that be good in that you know you'll get these plants and they'll turn out fine, whereas your problem can be isolated to yeah. some other area? Yeah. Um, Definitely. I think like a bait. Yeah, and a lot of organic farmers will do that. They won't necessarily leave like uh, a diseased plant in there, but they'll plant what are called um, trap crops or catch crops, where um, say you have really bad flea beetles on your in your area, um, they often go after like young tender brassicas like Mangina and Topsoy and. Um, even like these Chinese cabbage and stuff like that. If you plant a crop of, or a row of radishes or something that you don't really care to harvest, you can just maybe put them over there and have that and flea beetles be all over them. Um, and hopefully not come onto your crop over here that you're really focusing on building soil and having that 